Hello, I'm Darren Tansley and I work for the Essex Wildlife Trust. I work on the waterfowl recovery project in Essex and I also oversee a lot of the waterfowl conservation work in the UK. So for the last 25 years I've been looking at the plight of water voles on our waterways and in 2007 I joined Essex Wildlife Trust with a specific goal of bringing these animals back to our rivers. They're in crisis, we've lost around about 83% in Essex alone and even more across parts of our landscape in the UK. So hello, my name is Louise Dennis. I'm the Water Life Recovery Project Officer with Essex Wildlife Trust. So waterfowls have been with us since the last ice age and some consider them like mini beavers and that's because they are actually ecosystem engineers and what we mean by that is that through the process of creating their burrows and their feeding behaviours etc they actually create various different ecological niches for other animals as well um, and because of that, that also makes them a, an indicator of good habitat quality. So where you have water voles, you know that you've got a good variety of vegetation to support them and that their burrows in part will also be creating more habitat for more native wildlife. So the reason that the water vole has become endangered is unfortunately the mink, which is a very voracious mustelid, the females are actually able to fit into the water vole burrows and essentially decimate the population. But also more than that, they, they, they're opportunistic and they will take all kinds of, of wildlife, reptiles, birds. So it's really important, not just for the sake of water bowls, but for the rest of our native wildlife, that we, we do remove them from the food chain. So it's all very well undertaking a lot of waterfowl monitoring survey and maybe even a reintroduction. But if mink are just going to wipe out those water bowls afterwards, we haven't achieved anything. So after about 20 years of controlling mink and trying to keep the numbers down, we realised there was, there was no way out of that situation. Hundreds of mink were being trapped every year in each county. So we wanted to look at a strategy where we could put an end to this uh, yearly toll and, and actually do the job in one go. So these are all of the different components of what we call our smart rafts. So here you can see we have the physical raft itself. We've got the roof, the walls, and these pieces that keep it in place. I'll hammer that all into place and show you how that's constructed in a minute. And then we have the actual um, trap here with the remote um, as well. So this essentially is what makes our raft smart or digital. And how it essentially works is when the trapdoor comes down, when there's a capture, the magnet is pulled off of the remote device and that will send a text and an email alert to the responders and the project officers. And that means that we can respond within the quickest time as possible and minimising any distress to any animal in the trap. This is our physical raft here. It goes together pretty simply. You can use a hammer if you like, but the pieces are all designed to be very easily um, slotted in. Then you can go ahead and place the roof on and it should all slot into place. You want to make sure that these two holes line up and then you can go ahead. Now you don't have to, but it can be easiest just to use a hammer. So just hit it as close to the hole as you can. It's going very simply, so you don't need a lot of force. So just to make sure that everything is secure, we use these wedges and we cable tie them onto the raft through the holes. And that just stops any pieces moving around. So as you can see, it just goes in like that. So that's the wedge secured with the cable tie. You can cut the end off and you do exactly the same on the other side. And it's just to make sure everything's extra secure. So this is the standard humane trap that we use. Uh, very simply how it works is the mink will come in to investigate, sniffing the law that's in the ball here, 
And as they do so, they'll step on this treadle plate and it will, the door will snap shut. Um, now there are ways of setting the raft using this bar here so that if you're on quite a fast flowing stream, then you can make sure the trap is less sensitive or you can do it the other way around. You can reduce the bar so it's more sensitive. But in effect, the animal will come in, step on that plate there, and that will pull down the trap door. And then the animal is humanely kept inside until someone can respond. So once the physical raft, it's set, the physical trap itself is set with the cage door open, we then need to go ahead and make sure that the remote is both receiving signal and is set. So to reduce any bycatch or capture of non-target species, uh, specifically otters, we place these two otter excluders into the front of the raft where the opening is. They very easily slot in, as you can see, and it just makes sure that we are not harming our native wildlife. So here you can see we've got the raft in the water. Um, we've located it just on the water's edge, um, just next to the edge of this bit of reed bed here. And generally, if we can, we will either tether it to a tree or we'll put a post in the ground. And that's especially in flowing water to make sure that the raft remains where it is. So I really do believe in, in this project and its effectiveness. Over such short periods of time, we can see our native wildlife coming back. That can be exampled from Norfolk and Suffolk. And we know over three years with the right raft density, we can actually eradicate mink. And what we see there is then the renaturalization of our native wildlife. And of course, mink are not the only problem that waterfowls have had to face. We've had the industrialization of our landscape, the agricultural landscape. We have major developments uh, in areas where water vol strongholds are, housing and other structures, road building. So there are an awful lot of threats, some of which we can mitigate and some of which we can't. But if we can get the rest of the uh, landscape safe for them, then there's still plenty of really good high quality habitat out there for them to spread into and you can help out with your own woodlands management. If you've got a stream running through your woodland, what you need to do is try and get some light into that stream. Um, you know, coppicing the, the trees along the edge of the river, maybe cutting back a bit of the scrub so that it's a little further away and letting that light in, especially from the south, will create a lot of vegetation in that channel and allow water voles to be safe, thrive and feed in that environment and also allow them to get all the way through your woodland to the next little colony of water voles just down the stream.